All right, there. Thank hey, you, Ari. Yeah, thanks for, you know, again, thanks for taking the time. You know, I know you're super busy. It's the holidays, uh, but I really appreciate you being here with us. Um, and I'm sure the audience does as well. So, um, you know, if we had to sum up 2021, which, you know, it's probably equally crazy as 2020, uh, in one word, what would it be? So I think that it would be survival. I mean, we were able to survive another year of COVID restrictions, um, working with all of our financial institutions, you know, which includes our banks and all of our now depositories for them to survive and thrive actually um, during the pandemic and explore new ways of doing business with customers. Mm -hmm. Survival, huh? Okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm interested to see what the word would be for you in 2022 with the new variant and, you know, again, a lot of things kind of shifting around as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, we want to, you know, I personally am very interested in your career path, you know, kind of um, and as we have worked together for the last two years, I've always wondered, oh, you know, what was the story and where did she, how did she come to what she is today, right? So I'm sure the audience, are, you know, is also really curious about that <clears throat> as well. Um, you are a lawyer by training. And you worked in banking before joining the state, um, you know, as our commissioner. Maybe can you share your journey about how you got to where you are today? Um, and was it planned? Was it something that just came together? Yeah, so this particular journey being in banking is really um, not a pathway that I had sought. Um, it sort of happened just kind of by chance um, after I had my second baby <clears throat> and was ready to enter back into the workforce. Um, by chance, the, um, someone I had worked for um, during college had risen up to the level of um, COO of a bank, of a small bank. Um, and he had contacted me to see if he would, if I would be considered being his um, general counsel. And of course, you know, I was very interested. I did tell him, I don't know anything about banking. I have a checking account, I have a saving account, I have a mortgage, but that's pretty much all I know about banking. Um, but they were willing to take a chance. They, you know, trained me. And I would say that, um, you know, that was really the start of this whole career. I did um, work for them for five years. So it was a family owned bank. I worked for them for about five years and they were thinking about um, converting to a commercial bank. So they, and, you know, in order to gain that experience, they were not a commercial bank. And, you know, I told my boss at that time, um, I would leave and work for a brand new bank that just got established by the state. And that was um, Ohana Pacific Bank, which is a Korean based bank. And so I worked for um, Ohana Pacific Bank for a couple of years. And when you start out a new bank, one person wears many, many hats. So I learned probably a lot more than I did previously. I thought I knew a lot, but I really learned um, really the ins and outs of deposit taking, of how to process transactions, how to send wires out, how to do loans. Um, I was the vault teller. I mean, who would have guessed? You know, I, you know, I did so many things. And I think through that experience, um, you know, the, I really got to see the, really the inside of banking and how it really worked and how all the pieces that really all fit together and learn new things. Um, that was actually a pretty burnout job. Um, and so I only lasted two years <laughs> just doing all of that, all of those positions. Um, it was fun, but it was really a burnout job. And I sought a job um, with a large, um, with the third largest bank in Hawaii, just being just a regular attorney for them. And, you know, I was definitely looking for something. I wouldn't say it was easier, but it was really only one job, right? Instead of the seven jobs that I previously had. And I think that the, you know, I was able to guide that particular um, bank into um, changing its platform um, and working through a lot of their disclosures that they, um, that they still use today, actually, a lot of the policies. Um, and then, you know, hit the 11, and my job is actually appointed by the governor. Um, I was appointed by Governor Abercrombie. I didn't know Governor Abercrombie, um, you know, but he had sought um, someone who knew something about banking to be the bank commissioner. And um, after I was appointed, the bankers, the bank presidents had said that that was the first time in 
over 20 years that someone who was in banking was the bank commissioner and they were very happy with um, Governor Abercrombie and my appointment. Um, of course, he lost, Governor Abercrombie lost the election in four years um, and Governor Ike did reappoint me. Um, I was the only person in DCCA, the department that our um, division is attached to that was reappointed. Everyone else um, changed. And I think that that was in large part due to the confidence the bankers had in me and the confidence that they had that I could lead them um, you know, into the future, right? No one ha would have guessed that there would be COVID in between, but um, you know, they were just looking at the general future of banking. Well, there was a, you know, it's a, a lot of different shifts and pivots that you went through in your career path. Um, you know, mm -hmm. how, what was the decision-making process like for you as you transition from one stage to another and whether you, you know, decide to accept a job or, or opportunity? Yeah, so I think that the, the one thing, you know, to consider is, you know, the, the one good thing I had, I would I have to say, is I had a really good mentor. So when, you know, when I took the job, my first banking job, um, you know, I had known the COO, we had worked together, albeit when I was in college. Um, you know, he did have a lot of trust that I would learn all about banking, um, how to, you know, help run the company, you know, because I was their, their um, general counsel or their, their lawyer. And, you know, in that job, I was able to write a lot of policies, procedures, do a lot of training. And I think that through all of that, you know, I, I watched and learned from him to see how he approached things. And so when the opportunity came to, um, you know, leave and um, go to the De Novo Bank, the brand new bank, um, you know, I did seek his counsel because I didn't want to leave. But I, you know, what I did tell him at the time was, you know, do you think it's a good idea that I do this? Because I know that the bank wants to, you know, convert to something else. And, you know, I want to know what that's like and what that's all about to make sure that we don't fall into any of the traps. Um, and, you know, he was very supportive. Um, as it turns out, that bank did not convert to um, a commercial bank. And, you know, I did, you know, leave. <laughs> to go to a to a more sane, maybe not sane is a good word, but you know, to a different position um, that would afford me a little bit more um, freedom or free time, actually. Um, when I got the call to be the bank commissioner, I did seek his counsel again because now it would be weird, right? Now I would be supervising their bank, so our roles would be kind of switched. In you know, instead of him kind of guiding me. I would be guiding them. And so, um, you know, he was very supportive in me doing that. He, he actually thought that it would be a good idea. I mean, he, you know, I think he recognized that I had a lot of um, creative ideas and you know, kind of a direction that I thought banking would be um, heading into in the future. And, you know, he was very supportive. And I think with that support, I was able to make a decision that, you know, being the bank commissioner would be the next step. So, I mean, you know, of course, being, being the, uh, the commissioner involves a lot about politics, which, you know, of course, isn't something that you were exposed to that much in the private sector, right? I mean, was that right. something that was concerning for you or was it something that you were excited to embrace? Yeah, so politics is something, um, you know, I guess I'm interested in it. Um, way back in another career, I was... Um, Part of the House of Representatives, and so I got a taste of what you know that sort of politics is like. Um, I did get out of it pretty quickly. Um, what I did not anticipate when you get into a role like that is that there's politics within the body itself. I guess I just never expected. So naive, I was. It was just so surprising that there was more politics to be found. Um, but I think I've been always interested, sort of, in the politics end of it. Um, I just had not. Um, been doing it to the extent that I had to do as commissioner. You know, I, I did realize that I'd have to appear before the legislature, um, do information sharing. As you know, the government does not do any lobbying. We do information sharing. And so there was a lot of information sharing about what our industry does with the legislature. So um, were you, you know, did you feel 
that you were up for the job? I mean, or did you feel like, you know, there was a huge gap in terms of skills that you had to develop? Yeah, so I think that the, you know, at the time that I, that I entered into um, this new role as commissioner, it was 2011. And if you look back at 2011, banks were closing left and right. I mean, every Friday there was a bank closure somewhere in the United States. Um, you know, Hawaii had um, six state chartered banks at that time. And, you know, this is public knowledge, four out of the six were in danger of being closed. And so that's kind of how I took, took on this role. I mean, I knew when I was working at the bank that you know, all of our banks were in trouble, um, but I hadn't realized to the extent that they were in trouble. Um, and I know that when I first, um, one of the first phone calls that I got was from the FDIC. And you know, I thought they were gonna call me to congratulate me because you know, I had worked with some of them before, you know, at the different banks that I had been working at. And so that's what I was prepared for. I was not prepared for them to, at our very first phone call, for them to ask me, you know, when can they come in to teach me how to do bank closures? Like, don't come. <laughs> I don't think I need to learn that. Oh, wow. Um, but, yeah, you know, I think that that was, that was sort of an eye-opening experience, right? And you know, I just had no idea what was really going on. You know, I, I had to take a couple of weeks to figure out what the lay of the land was, um, what the staff that I had. Um, and then also the legislature was going on at the same time. And so I had all of that going on with Bill that you know, I hadn't even known about. And so it was quite challenging, I would say, in the very beginning. I am happy to say that Hawaii was the only state that did not have any bank closures. Um, through that oh, entire wow. period. We were able to work out with the FDIC and Federal Reserve Bank and the OCC um, not to close any of our banks. Um, we were able to work out resolutions for everybody. Um, it was hard work. Um, and I think that the banks really pulled through and um, made that happen. So was because that- As period? I told them, no, yeah. we were not gonna learn how to close banks. <laughs> was that a period of the uh, whole, you know, the economic, Kind of uh, instability during in, in 2011? Yes, yeah, so it was a mortgage um, crisis. Yeah, the mortgage crisis was going on full blast. I, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so they, yeah, we had the banks, we had consumers, you know, everybody was clamoring for attention, right? And yeah. Yeah. Whoa. yeah. I wasn't going to ask you this question, but like, you know, if it were me, I would say that's kind of like the, my defining moment as, you know, a commissioner, especially since it's like the first two years of my tenure. But would you, would you consider that like one of your biggest achievements as commissioner so far? Um, I guess that was a big achievement. I mean, I think that it wasn't just my achievement. I think it was really, as I said, the banks, you know, really pulling through, um, listening to our guidance, listening to the guidance of the FDIC and Federal Reserve Bank. Um, and I think that, you know, we had, we had forged a partnership. And I think because they understood that I, I came from banking, I knew what was going on. I knew how, you know, kind of how to guide them out of their troubles. I think that they were um, a lot more cooperative, I would say. Um, and I think that, you know, that was, I guess that was a defining moment. I would, I would say though, in my career, this might sound weird, but, my, I think my defining moment was when we were, when I was able to convince my staff um, through our strategic planning that we should do electronic processing for our licensing, consumer complaints, um, examinations, and we scanned um, within, our, within our office so we didn't spend extra money, all of our filing cabinets. Um, and so by the end of 2012, we were fully electronic. I think that was our defining moment. Yeah, so that's a really good segue, actually, because, you know, when I, uh, before I met you, um, when my boss came to me and told me I was going to work with you, he said, oh, you know, you're going to work with, uh, you're going to like her because she's a techie, you know, and she speaks technology like you, you know. Um, so, you know, you've already been positioned as a strong technology advocate within the state and your department, of course, um, you know, Besides that, that tech project, was there anything else? I'm sure I, I remember there were other like cool techie stuff that you did for your department. I mean, if you want to share with the <laughs> audience. 
Yeah, so I think that the, you know, so I kind of proved myself that I kind of knew what I was going or what I was doing um, just by doing all of this stuff. You know, I did not, just using the resources that we have and the platforms that we had, I think just pretty creatively to kind of get us to that electronic format. I think the other thing that I did was, um, you know, I redesigned our website, um, not by myself, but, you know, with help. Um, and, you know, the, the fact that they, that the um, that our website looks different than the other divisions within DCCA or even within the state, right? I mean, it 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 was kind of purposeful. I mean, I just wanted to be different, but I wanted to be um, user friendly at the time. Um, it does need a refresh. Um, there are a lot more restrictions now than there were back then, um, but we still I still do have control over the entire web page, and so I update it. I mean, it's probably updated every week. Um, and, you know, which is something that I don't think hardly any other departments do. Um, you know, and I think that that is, that sort of speaks to the confidence that the state ETS has given me. Um, you know, the other thing is that we, we bought, I bought laptops for all of my staff. I mean, even the secretaries have laptops. I mean, there's, you know, we spend a lot of money on that. And I think that that gives us mobility. Um, you know, in times of disaster. And really, I think we were practically the only department um, that when the governor said, okay, tomorrow you're leaving um, for, you know, at the time, two weeks to work at home because of COVID, we literally packed up, left the office. The next day we were up and ready. No one knew that we were um, working remotely. And I think that that was a tribute to the staff and you know, the great planning that we did. Um, we had been testing for different disasters. Um, this was not a disaster that we planned for, but it kind of worked out, <laughs> let's say. Yeah, yeah. You know, I remember uh, telling you know, my teammates, I'm like, oh, you know, yeah, the commissioner is also the webmaster and IT specialist for <laughs> DFI. <laughs> but it was really cool because I remember we were just starting, that was around March, and we were, we were planning to open our applications for the digital currency innovation right. lab, right? So we were all wondering, okay, is, you know, is there going to be downtime? But I believe we just stuck to the timeline. We just yeah. opened up everything for applications. The processing went well. Uh, and, and you guys started accepting payments online, um, you know, mm -hmm. for companies that right. wanted to participate in the program. So yeah. yeah, that is so awesome. You know, um, what was the challenge though? I mean, you would kind of getting those, um, transformative like IT changes within the department. Do you think it's a matter of culture or do you think it's more just, you know, old ways of doing things or just restrictions from top down? What, what would it be? Yeah, so, I mean, I think it's a little bit of all of that. I think that the one thing that um, my staff knew that when I came in that I was different, um, you know, I had all of these ideas that I wanted to implement and, you know, obviously I couldn't implement them all at one time, but, you know, I think that the, the they did know and I did, I had a lot of meetings with them, you know, invited them to um, strategic planning. I mean, that was the first time that they'd ever done that. And really that was the first time anyone in the whole department had done strategic planning. And I think that, you know, bringing them in, bringing them in my staff and talking about all of the changes that, you know, I wanted to make and the reasons why we should do that and getting the buy-in from all of them because I can't do this by myself, right? I have to include everybody. And I think that the, the one thing that um, sort of doing things the old way, there are a lot of employees, well, I won't say a lot, but there are a few employees that really like that paper-oriented processing and working through everything, right? That's what the state does. You know, they did learn pretty early on that if they, if that's what they wanted to do, continue to do, I would help them find another job. And I did. I mean, we actually moved out rare for people that way um, because every other state department, you know, processes through paper. So it wasn't that hard to find another place for them. Um, the stuff that did with me, I think, you know, they see value now or, you know, soon after we um, converted everything. I, I, would, I would say that, you know, when I started, I only had 29 warm bodies. Um, today I have 40. 
Um, and, you know, I think that that speaks to the type of supervision that we do, you know, being able to convince the legislature that we are protecting consumers um, and we need additional staff to, um, to protect consumers and make sure that our licensees are actually following all of the laws that are you know, enacted. Yeah, that's a that's a really good segue, you know, into the project that we are working on together, mm -hmm. right? That's also really tech focused, and I mean, it's emerging technology, you know, something mm -hmm. that Hawaii has been grappling with over the last um, five years, I would say. <laughs> Can go <Yeah>. back. <laughs> so it's you know, crypto, of course, that you know, it's a hot topic for Hawaii. Um, NFTs mm -hmm. is the word of the year, apparently. I think I don't remember which mm -hmm. body. You know, there's a body that chooses the word of the year each year and nfts is the word for the year this year so yeah, okay yeah but you know i remember there was the time when i also joined htdc two years ago and the first thing you know my boss told me was okay you're gonna work with the commissioner uh, ikeda on this digital currency thing and i'm like i have no idea what this is about you know uh, <laughs> i'm like sounds really difficult but okay um, and he was saying, oh, yeah, this is a really fantastic idea that she put out, you know, and we should do a good job on it. So, you know, maybe if you want to share with the audience, since this is your brainchild, like, how did they, how did it come about? And what is the critical role that it's, it's going to play for Hawaii? Yeah, so um, this is one of my, as my staff, as my staff calls it, another wild and crazy idea from the commissioner. Um, so this started probably about 2015 and I had been talking with the legislature about cryptocurrency and digital currency and how you know that's going to be playing a, a role in our financial um, services in the future they were not interested I introduced I started introducing bills um, in 2017 um, you know they didn't even hear it I mean I think that they weren't that interested it was just so new and you know this is all about the information that that government has to do it and, and you know after all of that after a couple of years of introducing bills that didn't go anywhere i decided to look to see what sort of authority that i have um, as commissioner to do a study and you know being able to to do this study as a creative idea and selling that to um to the attorney general who had to sign off and to the governor um, that this was not as crazy as it sounded um, that you know I think that that was that was a huge um, a huge win I think for the state just because you know we've been able to learn a lot um, from this particular project I think it was um, fortuitous that I knew the director of um, DBED the you know your department and, um, you know, to kind of pitch this idea because I needed a partner um, to do some of this techie stuff with us because I couldn't do it in-house um, all by myself because I couldn't do it all by myself. I needed somebody else to help me out um, and see that this wasn't as crazy as it sounded. Um, so it's a good thing HTDC was able to step up and the director, Director McCartney was able to, um, you know, kind of buy off on the idea. I think that our partnership is great. I mean, you were a great hire. And I think that the, you know, the fact that we've been able to um, go so far with this and do a lot of use cases um, that we had, you know, never anticipated, I think, is, a, is definitely a success for us. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think there is any, well, there are probably very few projects that, you know, are cross-departmental or cross- right. Right. So I think this is a really interesting kind of a way that we're working together from two approaches, from a regulatory approach as well as an economic approach. So, right. you know, we both know the answers, but, you know, for the audience, you know, what are you hoping to achieve through the DCIL? And, you know, yeah, so, yeah June 30th, 2022. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I hope that, um, you know, I think that for the near future, I think that the you know, we, we want to make sure that this, you know, continues to go forward. Um, and, you know, to make that happen, you know, I have a bill, you know, proposed to um, have a special purpose digital currency license, you know, for, for any of the companies that want to participate or have um, or do digital currency transactions. And I think that, 
you know, that is one goal. The second thing that is, is probably more towards the heart of what DFI does, it's really research and, you know, what is it that consumers really want from this digital currency? What do they want to use it for? Um, you know, how stable is it going to be? Do we need consumer protection? And if we do, I mean, I think we do, um, what does that look like? And so I think that, you know, doing a lot of this research has really opened our eyes as to um, how consumers are using um, this digital platform and, you know, why they want to use it. I think that that was just very interesting. It was also very interesting that so many people are using yeah, or I mean, doing these transactions. And, you know, the DCIL, it's, you know, again, not to brag, even though it's a project that both of us are on, but it's something that's pretty innovative, even across, you know, the nation, right, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. we, you could share, like, to your knowledge, like, who are the other, well, which of the other states are, that are doing this right now? Yeah, so there are, I think, six or seven states that have a um, digital sandbox, so to speak. Um, they were all created by the legislature. So ours is the only one that was created by my own powers, which is why it's short. You know, it's only a two year project. Um, the other states, um, you know, I've heard that they have only a few um, companies within their sandbox. Um, they were actually, you know, they were actually surprised that we had 15 participating companies. They're like, how did you get so many companies to participate in your sandbox? Like, well, I don't know. I mean, we solicited far and wide and we got a lot more um, applications than you know, the number of companies that we led into the um, innovation lab. But I think that the, I think the one thing that made our um, lab different besides the legislation is that it's being run by the, um, by the division of financial institutions. The other sandboxes are being run by the attorney general's office. And I think that there is some, um, I wouldn't say mystique, but there is, you know, there's something about having a sandbox run by a bunch of attorneys as opposed to financial regulators who might actually understand what this business model is all about. And I think that that is really the defining, um, the defining criteria between us, our sandbox, and the other state sandbox. Yeah, that's so I think we did it right, Ellen. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty, I'm pretty um, proud of, you know, the achievements we have had so far, especially in terms of engagement, even with the community and, and so on. And, um, you know, some of our quirky pilot projects that we put out, you know, with uh, using your authority to do that. Um, right. You know, of course, you know, this whole, you know, both of us know we have, you know, receive a lot of, uh, you know, praise. We have also received our fair share of backlash. We have received, you know, positive and negative uh, media criticism. What would you say is the public's, you know, kind of biggest misconception about DFI's stance towards crypto? Yeah, so I, you know, the, one of the things that um, I wouldn't say was driving this particular project, but we had a lot of um, negative publicity. Um, when we put out guidance in 2017 saying that if you know, any digital currency company who wanted to transact in Hawaii had to get a money transmitter license. I mean, that is the only license that is, um, that was kind of close to what we believed at that time, um, these, these digital transactions were like. And you know, if we were following other states, other states had used the money transmitter license also as you know the way to either license these companies or to exempt them from licensure, right? So everyone looked at the all of the other states looked at money transmission as the as the license. Um, and you know, like other states, although Hawaii was the only one that got negative publicity about this. Um, you know, in order to transact in, or in order to get a money transmitter license, you have to, you know, have a certain amount of um, what we call permissible investments, which is you know, a one-to-one -one matching of fiat currency.
Um, Iris, are you there? I think we might have lost you. For, so for those in the audience, um, if you just uh, hang in there, maybe we could try to see if we can get Iris back. Sorry, I think, I don't know if that was mine. It's okay. So, yeah, so we lost you when you were saying uh, the one-on-one -on -one match in terms of fiat currency. Yeah, so, you know, and companies cannot be, don't have that sort of cash on hand to do the matching process. And so, um, you know, we gained a reputation of being very unfriendly to all of the digital currency companies. And, you know, they, a lot of these companies, even the ones participating in our lab, um, really had negative press about us. And, you know, the, and I'm not really sure why Hawaii was singled out when other states had the exact same law and had the exact same type of um, policy that we did, or not even the policy, it was just the law, that was what the law required. And, um, you know, we just lived through it, I guess. Yeah, so, you know, I think this is a good uh, segue into one of the questions that we're getting in the Q&A from Joe, actually. Um, so Joe is asking, if the sandbox were to be extended, would the general attorney general and the governor need to sign off on it, or would it be done legislatively? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that the, the <laughs> I would say um, that it was not an easy task to convince the attorney general to let me do the Digital Currency Innovation Lab to begin with. Um, and the way that she had ultimately signed off on it was because it was a short-term um, research project. Um, you know, so I do not think that there's any appetite for the Attorney General to sign off and extend the um, Innovation Lab any further, mm -hmm. which is why we have the bill. And so hopefully, you know, we, we put a lot of eggs in this basket. Um, Actually, we put all of our eggs in this basket, <laughs> yeah. which is to, which is to have a, a license for the special called the special purpose digital currency license. Yep, and that's coming up in the next legislative session, twenty twenty two. So, right. for all of you out there listening in, this is our your way to getting um, Hawaii to become a more crypto friendly, um, you know, place to do business in and for for investments and so on. So definitely, you know, do your part in uh, in that legislative process, submit your testimonials mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, that being said, though, you know, I think just to think broader and bigger, you mm -hmm. know, with this whole rise of uh, DAOs or what they call decentralized uh, autonomous organizations, mm -hmm. um, do you think government regulation is even possible? Because I, I know we talked about that, but yeah. it's, our, it's part of your job, so... Right. So, you know, it is, you know, there's probably no way that government can regulate everything. I mean, I think that we wouldn't want to regulate everything anyway. Um, but I think that, you know, things that really touch consumers or that there could be possible consumer harm, um, you know, if things go bad. I think that's something that, um, that the government should be regulating. Um, I think that for us, our, my regulating style is really about teaching our licensees, the companies, about what the law is. So, and, you know, hopefully our current licensees will say this also, which is, you know, when they violate laws, I mean, you know, there are so many laws and really we're in the best place to know what all of these laws are. If we point it out to them, and usually it's not nicely, um, but we point it out to them, you know, that they violated certain laws, you know, if they are able to uh, correct their violations, you know, within a reasonable period of time, you know, the, the penalty is less harsh. Um, you know, we have done a lot of serious penalties, um, including revoking licenses when folks decide that, you know, they're going to see how far we're going to take it. And we will take it as far as we need to go in order to protect consumers. Um, and, you know, the, the one thing that um, I think I, I have been kind of good at is really um, having an education session every year after the legislature is done with each of the industries. 
to talk about what the new laws are, what changes there might be for them, how to comply with those new laws, and really just reaching out to let them know that we're, we are here to help them. Great. So, you know, besides crypto, right, which is, of course, the hottest topic for this year, are there any other tech developments that you foresee that would be causing disruption to the financial world and, you know, the state's ability to regulate, you know, within the financial um, ecosystem? Yeah, so that's a good question because we have been looking at other um, technology or financial technology companies, right? So a lot of these companies are really entering into what we would consider the traditional banking space, you know, offering banking services that normally banks would offer. Um, and really what we, you know, we think that that is a very innovative way to go um, for our banks, um, you know, if they wanna do that. Certainly these companies are, you know, devote more time and effort to making sure that you know, there are no bugs in um, whatever platform they are. And I think that for banks as they're partnering with these different technology partners or different technology companies, I think what banks are looking to the regulators or to us for is, you know, not a sign off, but to see if we're, we're supervising them in any way. Okay, so the prime example was, you know, back in 2015, 16, um, we put out several press releases um, and different um, publications that we, that DFI uh, supervised money transmitters um, because we had heard that a lot of banks were um, closing money transmitter accounts. And, um, you know, I decided that it would be a good time to remind all of our banks that no, we regulate money transmitters. We supervise them just like how we do you, banks. Um, and, you know, we have them feel a similar pain for examinations and ongoing supervision that we have for banks. And I think with that, you know, um, these money transmitters were able to get a lot more um, traction with banks. Um, banks reopened accounts or, you know, they went to other banks that were able to open accounts locally. And so I think that that really helped. So that sort of proved to me that if we, I wouldn't say advertise, but if we let our banks know that we are supervising different types of financial technology companies, they would be more willing to partner up with them and use their services. Yeah, I think one thing that was interesting for me, it's because, you know, um, Hawaii, you know, being um, our own, you know, our own state has our own like local banks. Um, mm -hmm. A lot more younger people are using kind of new banks, right? Like Chime. Mm -hmm. And what I realized was that, you know, DFI doesn't really regulate those people. It's a different mm -hmm. body. Is that mm -hmm. true? And like, how do yes. you, how do you circumvent any problems coming from those banks? Or is that something that is out of your jurisdiction? Yeah, so some of the neo banks are actually um, the banks supervised by the um, Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, the OCC, and so you know that is a federal banking regulator, um, and they are, you know, we assume that they are being regulated the same way that the FDIC and Federal Reserve Bank um, does their supervision, um, which is what we are familiar with. Um, so, you know, I think that for the most part, if if consumers are looking to use a neo bank like that, they should really check to see if their bank is supervised or regulated by some regulator. Just because you know, if you have if you have a problem with one of your transactions, there is a place to complain to and maybe get a resolution, as opposed to someone some company who is totally unregulated. Um, you know, once you lose your money, that's kind of it. Or you know, if, once you lose your identity. Or you know, once you're, once all of the, um, you know, once there is a kind of disastrous hack, or you know, as we've seen by some crypto companies, you know, the owner just absconds with all of the money. Yeah. There's no, uh, yeah. There's no recovery, right, for consumers. Yep. I mean, so this is a really. I think exciting time, you know, at least for because of the all this upheaval in technology you know, in the financial world, right? I mean, of course, we had digital payments and all that stuff that came up, you know, 20 years ago uh, with like PayPal and stuff like that. But now I think it's really 
I would say, a major disruption points with new technologies like blockchain. Um, you know, now that you're kind of in, you know, later in your career, is this, mm -hmm. is this something that's exciting for you? Or is this something that, you know, you're like, okay, let's slow down a little bit, you know, let me figure this out. Um, or yeah, how are you embracing all this change? Yeah, so I actually think it's pretty exciting that all of these companies are, you know, kind of starting up and, you know, thinking about different, creatively thinking about how to offer some of these services more um, streamlined or painless for consumers, right? And a lot of the, these painless solutions, um, you know, come with some risk. And I think that consumers don't realize what some of those risks are. Um, you know, for instance, we are, you know, it's a holiday season. And um, a couple of, or, you know, a couple of our banks use um, Zelle. And Zelle, you know, it's an instant payment, right? A lot of people like it because it's an instant payment. Well, the complaints we're receiving are more from, you know, you know Ellen, I wanted to give you money. And I thought this was your, your um, tag, but it really went to somebody else named Ellen. Um, and, you know, when I contacted that, that wrong person, they wouldn't give me back my money. I was like, yeah, <laughs> it's true. They don't have to give you back your money. Um, did, you know, did you not confirm with, you know, with the company? And you know, through all of that effort, I think Zelle is, has made a great effort by um, now requiring um, you verify the phone number of the person. Um, that wasn't something that they did in the past. And, you know, that's something that the regulators force them to do because we, we receive so many complaints. <laughs> it's like, okay, you need to do something. You know, we're, you, we are your, your regulators. We're getting all these complaints. What is it that you folks want to do to make sure we don't get more of these complaints or that, you know, we start fining you for, you know, not being able to verify that the payments are going to the right person. And so, our job is not to tell our companies what it is that they should be doing, but to ask them to come up with their own solution. And I think that, you know, different companies will come up with different solutions. And I think that that is perfectly fine. There are other regulators that want to be very authoritative and tell them what they should do. You know, really my style is they, sh they should use their own creative creativity to figure out how the best way to work with their customers. Great. Yeah. So um, there is a question in chat that I kind of want to bring up because I think Iris, you talked about it, uh, but, you know, it'd be great to kind of clarify. Um, mm -hmm. So D is asking in chat, what does the state of Hawaii require for a cryptocurrency exchange platform to operate in Hawaii? And again, this is the second question. It's something that I would say is a, the biggest misconception ever. Why did Coinbase pull out of Hawaii? Right. Oh, OK. All right. So for the first question, you know, the, the companies that are in the innovation lab right now, they were, um, I would call them, we did a, what, we, what I would call a soft bet to make sure that they just met minimum requirements, right, to be part of the innovation lab. The lab is actually closed right now um, to applications. And, you know, the, you know, if any other company um, gets in, it would be through you know, a huge exception or that we have been working with them um, all this time and you know, now their application is finally you know, complete. Um, but you know, the, for the most part, all of the companies had to um, you know, provide us with financial disclosures, um, what their policies were for anti-money laundering, for crypto, uh, not crypto, cybersecurity, information security, um, you know, agree that they're going to be um, conversant with us to provide us different reports on, you know, their business platform and all of that. And so, you know, the 15 companies that are in the lab right now have agreed to do that. And I think that we've gotten a lot of good information from all of them. Regarding Coinbase, so Coinbase, I mean, I think that they did not pull out of the, um, out of the innovation lab, is that what the question was? Oh no, the question was why did Coinbase pull out of Hawaii? Oh, okay. So Coinbase pulled out of Hawaii because they could not meet the requirements for a money transmitter license. 
And, you know, just like any other of the companies, right, they, they were not the only one um, that could not meet the money transmitter licensing requirements. I think what is the most actually interesting for me being part of this project is, you know, the fact that a lot of these crypto companies actually want regulation and they've been asking for us for, you know, kind of the frameworks for regulation, right? Is that right? I mean, just yes. based on my, my, what I've been observing so far. Yeah, so we, I did think it was kind of interesting and that was something that we were gathering through our innovation lab also is, you know, do they even want regulation? You know, my knee-jerk reaction would have been they, they do not want regulation. I mean, who wants to be regulated all the time? But amazingly enough, like you said, they, they did want some regulation. What they're looking for is some guidelines or some guardrails under which to operate under, right? And, you know, really it would be to level the playing field for all of these companies to operate in the same way. They all have the same rules. They have to play by, you know, whatever the standard is. And I think that that makes it fair for everyone. Um, you know, the way that we look at these um, these companies, you know, for all of our licensees is we don't look at the platform that they use. We don't really look at, um, we don't opine on their business model. You know, it's really about um, consumer protection and making sure that they are financially sound in order to operate. So, you know, I think um, also because we're nearing the end of the session, um, I'm curious to know, know, how do you want to be remembered as, um, you know, the commissioner of, the, of our division of financial institution? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. And, you know, something I've been pondering for a while because, you know, if there's an election coming up, I don't know that I'm going to be reappointed. You know, I think I was lucky the last time. Um, but, you know, I think that the, the one thing that I'm hoping to be remembered as is, is as an innovator, someone who is not afraid to take on um, a lot of these innovation issues, um, someone who was not afraid of technology and, um, you know, try to embrace technology in a way that, that we could as a regulator. That seems kind of odd, but I think that the, you know, having that um, mindset to being creative and wanting companies to explore different ways to offering um, financial services, I think is, you know, something that I want our companies to continue to do. So, you know, just want to talk about some of the fun stuff, you know, in the last 20, 30 minutes was really intense. <laughs> <All our crypto. laughs> you know, I, I'm sure being a commissioner keeps you really busy. Like, how do you stay inspired and what else are you passionate about? Yeah, so I think that the, the one thing that is really inspiring is, you know, just kind of, um, you know, talking with my staff about, you know, what it is that they see or what it is that they want. Um, you know, I think I'm pretty fortunate that the um, average age in my, um, of my staff is probably in their 30s, um, which is pretty young, actually. Um, you know, they're, they all have, I would say, um, at kind of at the beginning of their career or they had, um, you know, only worked for a few years. And I think that, you know, having that perspective um, is really helpful um, because this whole, this whole space is just um, changing so much. Um, added to that, you know, I have, you know, young adults as my as children. And, you know, I think that the way that they think um, is also very interesting and, you know, definitely different than the way I grew up. But, you know, I think that having that sort of creative way of thinking is really helpful. I mean, I think for the most part, um, I have tried to be pretty creative in solving problems. The other thing I guess that I'm pretty passionate about is, um, you know, I like to sew. I mean, that is sort of a, a pastime that not too many people do. So, you know, I used to, I hardly do this anymore, but, you know, I used to make all of my clothes and, you know, and that was kind of a fun thing. Um, today, I make a lot of quilts, um, you know, for, for folks who, um, who have um, like old shirts or old t-shirts and, you know, kind of form them up and to cut them up so that they can keep it for, you know, so much longer, right? And so... And as a memory. 
Yeah, wow. I mean, that's a skill that not a lot of people have, honestly, anymore. Yeah. You know, like sewing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. I, I, I tried doing it for uh, my, you know, uh, for people, and they're like, oh, you can do a cross stitch. I'm like, that's the extent of what I know. Um, yeah, can't go further yeah. than that. Um, but yeah, so I think another interesting thing um, for the audience as well is how do you stay up to date with all these tech trends? Even for me, I have, you know, it's, I have problems keeping up, right? Reading about, crypto blockchain and AR VR yeah. and all that kind of stuff and I'm in technology how about yourself like how do you keep up to date yeah I would say I'd, I'm not really up to date <laughs> you know I mean I think that you know they you know thanks to you know like different google searches or youtube or you know just different publications mm -hmm. um you know it's really where I pick up a lot of the information um, you know, a lot of the information I get is really regulatory about, you know, different financial or technology companies and um, just reading about the different violations that other um, federal and state um, regulators are, are enforcing. You know, it is pretty interesting and, you know, really it's all about how these companies are doing business. And I think for some of the regulators, because they don't really understand, you know, I'm not saying that I understand either, but because they don't really understand how that business model works or how that technology works, I think it makes them really uncomfortable and sort of fast to see a violation when there might not be one. Yeah, so, you know, um, I, I actually do want uh, to get your kind of um, answer to this question that Stacy has put in our Q&A. Um, okay. asking, do you recommend that those who have invested on platforms allowed in a sandbox withdraw their funds by the June 2022 deadline? Yeah, so I, you know, I don't really have an answer to that. I mean, I think it's going to be a personal choice. I would say that you should watch the legislative process. Um, if we get our bill, um, the bill will allow the participants in the lab to continue until the um, license is available. Um, so you would not have to um, withdraw any of your funds at that point. Um, if the bill does not get through the legislature, the um, lab will end. And so everyone will have to withdraw um, or close out their accounts. So, you know, kind of a lot depends on what, what's going to happen at the legislature this year. So that's a great segue into my next question for you. What are you looking forward to in 2022? <laughs> Yeah, so that bill for one, um, but two, I think that the, you know, just continue to explore with our banks uh, of their digital partners or their um, fintech partners that they want to partner up with. Um, and I think that the, you know, all of our banks are, you know, kind of exploring different fintech companies to do business with, um, to, you know, make their um, financial products more accessible or friendlier or you know just better for consumers right it's all about the consumer experience and so i think that you know as we continue to do that you know each one of them will continue to grow i hope how about on the personal level anything you're looking forward to in 2022 more travel perhaps or yeah, I mean, I think so. You know, with the um, Conference of State Bank Supervisors, um, which is our, um, which is the organization for um, state bank regulators, um, you know, in the past, before COVID, you know, I think I was traveling almost every month um, oh, wow. for some CSBS meeting. And, you know, I think that traveling and meeting and talking with um, the different commissioners and the different staff um, about the, the different issues that they're finding, I think is really helpful, um, you know, for our state, you know, because I can learn and grow with, with all of those conversations. I think the other thing that um, that's really helpful is that the, you know, just being on different committees. So I recently joined a committee with the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network. That is not fin FinCEN. That is a very interesting group. Um, they don't like to share too much, I would say, but, you know, they, you know, it, it was quite a coup, I think, to get on, to be the representative for 50 states. Um, oh, wow. So you are the representative for the 50 states? 
Yes. That oh wow, okay. <laughs> That's so interesting. It sounds yeah, it sounds like a really intriguing uh committee to be on. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Very secretive. Yeah. <laughs> So maybe, you know, uh, as we're nearing, you know, to the end of the session, just to wrap it up, you know, I, I always ask one question um, to every single guest, um, you know, give us one word that you would like to leave the audience with today and why. So I think my word would be um, imagine. So it's really about imagine, um, you know, what you want, you know, what way you can make the world better? What way you can make you know, Hawaii a better place to live? And really through you know, really imagination and different crea creative ideas, um, I think that that is a way to move our state forward. Um, you know, I hope that I practice that on a regular basis, or maybe I should ask my staff. They probably think I do practice that too much. <laughs> but you know, I think that you know, really to imagine what life or how you can make life better, I think is really what I'm most passionate about. And, you know, just making it better for not just me, but for the entire state. Yeah, that's, you know, that's so awesome. Um, yeah, thank you so much though, uh, Commissioner Iris Keta for, you know, sharing your thoughts with us today, for working with me and, you know, with all your patience as we get through this, this project together. You know, I, you know, on behalf of HTDC, of course, you know, I wish you all the best in your future uh, imaginary projects that are coming up. <laughs> and for us, you know, hoping to pass the, legis the bill in the next legislative session in 2022. Um, thank you so much for what you're doing for Hawaii. And, you know, we really appreciate you and your service. Um, for yeah, time. thank you so much. I mean, I really appreciate you know, being recognized as someone in tech. I don't really think about myself that way. Well, you definitely, definitely a tech advocate, definitely someone, you know, that's, that's really helpful. Um, even for us here at HTDC, we can't do all this alone um, as well, you know, without you. So thank you. And for yeah, those you. of um, you who have been listening and joining all our Women in Tech sessions through the year, uh, we thank you for your support and for joining us every single month. Um, I wish you a really happy, you know, wonderful holiday season, uh, very happy, happy new year, um, and may 2022 be a wonderful year for all of you.